If you look at this, <laughs> if you look at this highly accurate scientific map of my home state, you'll see I was born at the intersection of corn and absolutely nothing. Then when I was four, we moved to a small town in Rednecks. Early 2000s, Otsego, Minnesota only had a couple thousand people. One stoplight, one gas station, and of course, a liquor store. I don't think you can be considered a town in, small, in Minnesota unless you have a shoddy carpeted liquor store lined with posters of well-endowed women who happen to be posing next to cheap beer. As a kid, my dad regularly invited me on his beer runs. I would gleefully accept because the cashier gave the kids lollipops. And to be honest, there isn't much else to do. Small town Minnesota has limited pastimes if you're not a drinker. Not much culture besides going to church, going to Target, and going outside. Every Minnesotan license plate reads, Land of 10,000 Lakes. Due to glaciers melting several thousand years ago, the state is covered in fresh water, lakes, swamps, creeks, and rivers. As a teen, my older sister would often gather a group of rowdy friends, get Mike's Hard Lemonade from someone's older brother, <laughs> tie inner tubes together, and spend a day floating down a slow, shallow river called the Crow River. She extended the invitation to me a few times, but I always declined. I wasn't a big drinker. Also, tubing sounded boring. You just float for hours. That's it. The summer after I graduated high school, my longtime friend Katie and her boyfriend Blake presented me one last chance. It was a cloudless, steamy August day, tubing weather. You know, Blake and Ryan have been friends forever. We could go as a group, Katie encouraged me. Ryan was my new boyfriend and my longest relationship yet, two whole months. Yeah. Woo. Long before my slut phase, I was painfully nervous around cute boys. I would get anxiety shits before every date, sometimes during, and would stutter or go blink in conversation. As for my sex life, the only thing getting wet was my armpits <laughs> with oniony stress sweat. But with Ryan, it was easier. Despite his size, he was not intimidating. Ryan played one of those defensive football positions for big tall dudes. He was a gentle giant with loose blonde curls and a but an adorable little nose, kind, patient, and smart. We both happened to be headed to the same university, me for social science, Ryan for pre-med. I liked Ryan. I liked making out with Ryan and dry humping Ryan. <laughs> I didn't love Ryan, not yet. I couldn't get over the fact that he wore polos and khakis on our dates like someone's freaking dad. <laughs> But I was interested to see where things would go, to see if I was capable of sustaining a relationship and more importantly, overcoming my fear of sex. And a partially clothed romantic afternoon in nature with just me and him and our two friends could be a good time. You know what? Tubing sounds fun. Let's do it, forest emoji, I reply to Katie. <laughs> Here's how tubing works. You need two cars, one to bring you to the starting line and one to wait for you at the end. That day we drive to the end point, take a careful look around so we can remember where to climb out. We notice a sharp turn in the river, a break in the foliage and one slightly taller tree by itself. My sister always started her trips at 10 a.m. but my friends and I weren't much for mornings or planning. We didn't park until 2 p.m. It took my sister about five hours to make it down, so we should be crawling out onto the riverbank or crawling into a bush or a, maybe a bed of wild flowers as the <laughs> summer sun was setting. Plan secured. None of us want to risk waterlogging our phones, so we leave them in the car, welcoming a digital break. With a rope, Blake ties our tubes together by the handles, and the group takes our first steps into the Crow River's pebbled bed. 
The water reaches my knees, lukewarm from an afternoon under the sun. We place water bottles and snacks in our cup holders and place our butts in the netted bottom of the tube. Ryan, a gentleman, pushes us off from the shore. <laughs> he holds my hand as we stall in the center of the river and wait for the current to take us. It seems uncertain of the challenge, but gradually accepts our weight and pushes us ahead. The river feels incredibly private, transporting us to our own world. Surrounded by tall trees and thick brush, we quickly lose sight of the road and anything more than 10 feet off the river. There are no other people tubing and no hiking trails. The buzz of the highway fades and is replaced by the chatter of songbirds and a gentle breeze in the leaves. The water moves us at a snail's pace. My anxiety leans in and whispers, this is so boring. <laughs> You're going to go crazy. I prefer to speed walk like an angry New Yorker through the high school hallways, and this current was a couple holding hands, clogging up the corridor, forcing me to slow down. I exhale. I notice how the breeze makes the, the leaves shimmer in the sunlight, how the air smells like the color green. I dip my hand in, and I feel the smooth water pass between my fingers gently. Wow, what's this feeling? Peace? An hour in, the bottoms of our tubes start to graze over some rocks. Uh, did we just stop, Ryan says? We pick everything up and carefully walk over the teetering rocks to return to the water on the other side. 20 minutes later, it happens again, and then again. At one point, the water recedes completely and our tubes stop in mud. Is the water usually this low? I ask as we get off the tubes, our toes sinking into the slimy riverbed. A collective shrug. I give in to my anxious urges. I want a little exercise, I say, as I kick my legs to propel us forward. Later, we pull our tubes onto the shore and stop to stretch and eat oranges. Katie sneaks behind a tree to make out with Blake. My chance. Should we cuddle on the tube? I suggest to Ryan with an innocent smile. <laughs> he sits on his tube and I follow onto his lap and give him a wet kiss. <laughs> he pulls me in for more. I feel something firm pushing onto my thigh. <laughs> and I reach down curiously to inspect. My religious upbringing leans in and whispers, what are you doing, slut? Don't you know men will leave you after you give them what they want? <laughs> oh my God, shut up. But I retract. Mentally, I don't want to lose my virginity with my friends right around the corner, but physically, I really do. <laughs> Five hours after surrendering to the current, the sky turns a vibrant orange. It's stunning, but it also means my chances to find a more private opportunity to get naughty with Ryan are running out. <laughs> and it means our trip is coming to an end. Or does it? How far do we have left, Blake, I ask. I don't know, I've never done this path before, he says matter-of-factly. What? <laughs> no worries, cool, 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 cool. <laughs> But there are, in fact, many worries. <laughs> the sun sets and the warm tones are turning blue. The air is getting cooler on our uncovered skin. With a dim glow left over in the sky, Katie and I climb up the bank to get a look around, hoping something looks familiar. Once we get past the trees, we're hit with tall rows of infinite corn. I listen for a highway. I hear nothing but the buzz of wildlife beginning in the night. We rejoin the boys and weigh our options. We don't have our phones. We are wearing wet, cold bathing suits. The temperature is dropping. It is now pitch black. We are lost. My anxiety leans in and whispers, panic? <laughs> this seems like the time we should panic, but no one has explicitly said the word lost. We say things like, we gotta be close. 
Let's pick up the pace. My nipples are so hard. I shiver. My fingers become stiff and my toes numb. As a cold-blooded creature, I need the sun to stay warm, or at the minimum, clothes. I was never one of the hardy Minnesotans wearing a t-shirt shoveling snow. I was the Minnesotan threatening to move to California at the first goosebump. I did it. <laughs> we are still running into rocks, and stumbling over them in the moonlight is not the safest bet. We could risk twisting an ankle or falling onto a jagged edge, but what else can we do? I'm a little cold, I say casually. Should we, like, set up camp for the night until we can see again? I don't... No, Ryan says. Katie asks, can anyone build a fire without a match? <laughs> Four blank faces stare at each other. Let's just kick our legs a little faster. The conversation dies down and we focus all our energy on moving forward as quickly as possible, keeping our minds busy, too busy to entertain concerns like exposure, injury, possum attack. <laughs> Every time there's a sharp turn in the river or a break in the trees, we stop, carefully climb up and look around for a road, a glowing sign of a business in the distance or some form of civilization with no luck. With nightfall, the woods grew loud with the drone of bugs and croaking frogs. We're continually startled by a sudden rustling of leaves or a snapping of a twig from who knows what. Sleeping is out of the question anyway. We see another possibly familiar break in the trees, but everything is dark silhouettes at this point. We climb up and don't see our cars. No business signs glowing in the distance, but there's a road, a road, the most beautiful road yeah. I've ever seen. <laughs> Now, all we have to do is find the car, somewhere along the asphalt, in the dark, barefoot, half naked. At least we have guys with us, I say to Katie, although I still feel incredibly vulnerable, and after this experience, I'm no longer convinced they jump in and save the day. <laughs> A truck comes speeding down the road and stops abruptly in front of us. We stare into the headlights for the first time. I feel like I am in a horror movie. <laughs> Just when you think the main characters are saved, are things going to get even worse? Blake confidently walks towards the truck and throws his tube in the bed. What is he doing? I ask Katie. Get in, a deep voice echoes. It's Blake's dad. He's been looking for us. Everyone has been looking for us. It's 10 p.m. <laughs> Parents have been called. Cops have been called. Water Patrol sits us down and gives us a lecture, which I find to be excessive. I'm not a child. I'm 18. Even still, I crawl into my bed that night, realizing I was so close to not being there wrapped up in blankets, so close to having to deal with the consequences of my actions. So close. <laughs> a week later, I hang out with Ryan and we're recounting the adventure we shared, what went wrong, namely a drought and poor planning, and how lucky we are that things turned out okay. Ryan paused thoughtfully and said, no matter what happens between us, we'll always have shared this experience together. <laughs> which at the time felt like he already didn't see a future for us. <laughs> and he didn't, he broke up with me in my dorm before classes even started. <laughs> Fuck around, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> he didn't have time for a relationship in college. Bro, we're at the same college. <laughs> I can walk to your dorm. My sister reassured me, Shana, it's not personal. He probably saw some hot girls on campus and wants to have sex with them. My fear that boys just want one thing faded as I discovered, bitch, I'm horny too. <laughs> Turns out sex is a lot like tubing. You get wet, 
It can be relaxing or anxiety inducing. Planning and safety are important. <laughs> it takes time to learn a new body of water. <laughs> Denying you're lost is pretty common. <laughs> and no matter what, good or bad, long haul trip or one night adventure, at the end, you'll always have shared the experience together. <laughs> Shana Jurens, ladies and gentlemen. Shana.